Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the channel, and I'm going to keep this part of the video as short as possible because it's a busy, busy day. It's been a busy 24 hours. Transfer season is well and truly underway. Right, uh, before we go any further, please make sure to drop down below and hit the like and subscribe button. It's absolutely free. The support over the past week has been magic. We are well and truly on our way to 35,000 subscribers. So if you haven't already contributed to the cause, then that would be very helpful to turn that big red subscribe button to a grey subscribe button. Um, yes, let's not waste too much time. Let's get into this um, because there's a lot to talk about today. I'm getting the fear that this video might be just a little bit too long for a regular Celtic transfer talk. As I said in the intro to the video, it has been a very interesting 24 hours. If you're on social media and you're reading the papers, you'll be seeing story after story, rumour after rumour, linking Celtic with every Tom, Dick and Harry. And it's the most beautiful time of the year. And I said this a few weeks ago, but this series, Celtic Transfer Talk, ultimately it's the series where we talk about 50 different players every transfer window, only for 5 or 6 to actually become Celtic players. It's been a very interesting ride over the past 5-6 years on this channel in relation to transfers, and I love it. I love every single minute of it, because I just like discovering new players, I like doing my reading, my research, and finding out more about these guys, just in case names from the past pop up or they come up again in the future. It's always fun, uh, so I'm just going to be doing the same here. But on that note, I just wanted to address a specific point, and that was to do with rumours and paper talk. I often get comments... Uh, in these videos talking about how not to believe the papers, how to, you know, just disregard everything they say because they can't be trusted, this, that, next thing. And to a, a, a massive extent, I agree with that. The, the the current day MSM in Scotland is not the most reliable and certainly not the most trustworthy when it comes to sources and stories and everything else. I completely understand the apprehension towards believing what they say. However, what I do here is just go through what they say. I see what I see. I see, talk about what I see. And I basically just give my opinion to all. We're also trying to inform you on the players that we are being linked with. Now, some of them might not sign and some of them might just be nonsense to sell some papers. But at the end of the day, it's nice to know who these guys are and it's nice to know what they could offer to Celtic. And that's the entire point of Celtic Transfer Talk. It's not to just say these guys are signing for Celtic. It's to have a look at the players to see what they would offer the club and whether or not they're the right or wrong signing for Celtic. Just thought I'd put that wee disclaimer out there to start the video because why not? Let's just get into things though because we've got three different players to talk about today. Some of them you may have already read into, some of them you might already know a lot about, but for me it was interesting because I didn't know too much about them and that's what I enjoy about this series. So let's get going and let's talk about player number one as Celtic look to bolster their attacking options. The first player on today's agenda is indeed a striker, it's someone who bolsters the attacking options at Celtic and it's none other than Ferenc Faros forward Ryan Mai who has been linked with the club after a spectacular season with the Hungarian side. A team that we know all too well, uh, of course that, that game a couple of years ago is the one that pops to mind, but the team that we also played on two occasions this season in the group stages of the UEFA Europa League, he also competed against Celtic in those games where we managed to get six points against them. A, a tough side to beat, uh, let's not be... Let's not be kind of naive here and talk about them. A very, very talented side. And Ryan Mai is someone who has had a fantastic campaign um, playing for Ferenc Faros and now being linked with a move to Celtic. It's someone who I'm very much a fan of his signing. I, I spoke a few weeks ago on the need for a striker and we'll touch on that. You know, we're, we're in such a great position with Kyogo and Georgius Yakimakis. Maybe there is room for one more. Um, and I think that we, there has been sort of murmurs from behind the scenes that Ange was looking to add a striker. So it certainly makes sense why we're being linked with the Moroccan. There has been no official approach or no uh, sort of inquiry by, by my understanding at this moment in time, but apparently, yes, the club have been interested in the player. 24-year-old Moroccan international, and as I said, plays for Ferenc Varos, contributing to a goal every 83 minutes this season. A fantastic record. You know, we talk about the records of Giacomacchus, we talk about the records of Kyogo Furuhashi, um, you know, these are fantastic goal records. And even you look at strikers like Eduardo, who had a fantastic kind of goals to minute ratio. It was fantastic. And, and I think that now we have another player who fits that mould and scoring goals regularly. And he's right up there with some of the best records we've seen at Celtic in, in recent times. An incredible season, um, to say the least, for Ferenc Varos. Let's dance over some of the stats. 19 goals and 11 assists in all competitions this season 
for the player, a fantastic record to say the least, I've used the word fantastic a lot but I think you know what I'm trying to say, 51 goals in his senior career, uh, I think just over 140 appearances, this season in particular though he's been on fire and it's a kind of the kind of season that attracts interest from elsewhere and this is another one of these markets that now Celtic are diving into that probably don't attract the same amount of interest as other leagues would, which is great because we're finding all these gems from everywhere and this is you know a, a Moroccan international playing in the Hungarian league, it's not somewhere you would normally look but he's obviously doing things right if you're scoring 19 goals and that's you can't just disregard players like that you know you know how to find the back of the net and that's the most important thing he finds himself in the right areas from the reading I've done he likes to keep himself between the sticks and scored goals and that's the kind of striker that you know is going to thrive in Scotland you know a goal scorer a natural goal scorer with the instinct to score goals it's someone that you want to try and bring in and improve um, the already fantastic record we have here at Celtic with our strikers. Been vital um, in their season. He's also been very important in the Moroccan qualification for Qatar 2022. He's played for them in the World Cup qualifier, scoring four times, assisting as well on their way there. Um, so you're talking about a player who's been doing it international level and at club level. He's been doing it, of course, in Morocco, who play in the, the kind of African segment of qualification, um, but still very much impressive. He also, and this was something I only figured out about 10 minutes ago when doing my research, he played for the Belgium youth setup right up until the under-21s level where he then chose to go and play and represent the Moroccan national team. So he's played in a very good setup, a, a very good footballing nation. We all know how good Belgium are at the moment. They've got one of the strongest sides in world football, a very hard side to get into, you know, there will be plenty of strikers ahead of him in the pecking order, but he's now went and challenged himself playing for the Moroccan national team, I believe he's also uh, eligible for the Cameroonian national team as well, so, you know, this is a guy that's scoring goals everywhere he goes at the moment, and, and that's just perfect for Celtic. But it begs the question, do Celtic need another striker? Do we spend money on bringing in another option up front? Um, this was something I touched on a couple of weeks ago, and I believe so, yes. I really do think that Celtic could do with another striker. We've currently got to put two best strikers in the country. There's no doubt about that. Georges Giacomakis, Kyogo Furuhashi, they are the two best strikers in Scotland. They had a fantastic season, respectively. Kyogo, especially in the first half, and Georges Yakimakis more in the second half. They contributed to what was a fantastic league-winning campaign, as we all know. But there is still room for more. And I know Dyson Maida, who is technically a striker as well, can fill in in that role. I think we've figured out he's better on the left. You know, Kyogo and Georges Giacomakis are two players who in the first season have struggled with injury issues. We play a very sort of expansive style of football that is very demanding, that can see players trickle off with injuries now and then. We're also now in a situation where we're playing a lot of football. We're playing a League Cup, Scottish Cup, the League Campaign and the Champions League. Very high intensity games all round for the vast majority of the year. Um, yes, we've got the, 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 the less, lesser pressure with no qualifiers, but you're playing a lot of football, which calls upon for rotation from time to time. And to add in another quality striker, there is nothing wrong with that. You cast your mind back only 20 years ago when Chris Sutton, John Hartson and Henrik Larsson were playing in the same team. There wasn't an issue with having the three of them then, so I don't think there's a, a big problem with having three quality strikers now. Um, I think that's one thing that we should consider, bringing in another striker. I think it would strengthen our chances at scoring more and more goals and ultimately that's the type of football we want to play. Ange Postacoglu's football is score goals. So yeah, there we go. That's the first name. Spoke longer than I thought I would but we'll keep an eye on him and I'll keep you the, up to date with developments as they go along. So we'll head to the other end of the park then and we'll go to the centre back area, a position which I already voiced that I would like to see someone come in um, and, and add some depth to that sort of area. We all know Christopher Julien will probably leave the club, Starfelt, and Carter Vickers are the two first choice centre halves at the minute. Carter Vickers isn't officially a Celtic player yet, but beyond those two, we've really only got Stephen Welsh, um, and that's just simply not enough. I don't want to rehash the same points I brought up a minute ago about the, the amount of football we're playing, but we need more options than Stephen Welsh, put it that way, um, and we need first team quality options as well, and I, I think Stephen Welsh is first team quality, but there's certainly, you know, times where you're playing bigger games, and you kind of want better options than Stephen Wal what, Walsh, Welsh, behind the centre-halves we have got, so we have been linked with two centre-halves, two centre-halves from the same club, and this is where it gets sort of interesting, so we've been linked with two centre-halves from Manchester City, which... If you remember, a couple of weeks ago, we signed up uh, Mark Glowell, the son of Peter, to become our head of recruitment at Celtic. He was a, a guy who worked with the City Football Group for the best part of the last decade. 
um, including a, an extensive spell at Manchester City especially. We're now being linked with two centre-halves at Manchester City. This is where these links come very, very handy. And Manchester City are a club who don't develop bums and they don't take on nobodies or anybodies. They develop very good players. And even if they don't make the grade at the senior team at Manchester City, you usually see a lot of these guys leave their youth systems and go on to have successful careers or move elsewhere and do something. Um, and this is where Mark Lowell will come very handy because over the next few years, we'll see ourselves probably linked with players from that city group, both down to him and Ange Postacoglu sharing a relationship with the City group. So, very interesting indeed. We're going to talk about two players now, both in the centre-half position, one of the names you might recognise from Celtic transfer talk last season. The first name is Ko Ikatura, the Japanese international centre-half who spent last season on loan to Schalke in the Zweite Bundesliga in Germany. They won that division, they got promoted, they are now returning to the top flight of German football. However, his move, his permanent move to Schalke doesn't look too promising. Apparently they are hesitant in paying the £6 million obligation or the £6 million um, fee that has been involved in the contract. It's too much money for Schalke at the moment, so unless they kind of find the money elsewhere to, to pay that in the coming weeks, it looks as though he return to Manchester City. Now, very interesting because, of course, last season we were linked with, with Koei Katura. He was one of the first names that was suggested as an Ange Postecoglou signing when he came through the door, around a similar sort of time as Kyogo Furuhashi joining the club, his fellow countryman. Um, he's now going to return to Man City if Schalke, and just let me get my date right here as I look for it, if Schalke don't make a decision um, by the 31st of May to strike that option to buy fee, Ikatura will go back to Manchester City, his options will be open, and Celtic are monitoring that situation. Now, that being said, there are clubs in Germany who are apparently interested in the Japanese centre-half, and you'd imagine that as a host of clubs in the top flight of German football. He probably enjoyed life in Germany, it looked as though he did anyway, so I wouldn't be surprised if they were to manage uh, to pip their way in ahead of Celtic. But we are now certainly in a position where we can, can compete for a signing like this from Manchester City. With the Champions League football that we offer, with the Japanese contingent that we already have at the club, there's a lot of desirable effects of coming to Celtic. And I'm sure that Ange Postecoglou is someone who will have had or will have words with a player like himself to try and improve our back line at Celtic. So the, 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 the gauntlet has been laid. Apparently Celtic are monitoring the situation. It's just about waiting out and seeing what happens with him and his current loan club, Schalke, in Germany. Now, the only thing I wanted to bring up about this in regards to a, a signing of Koei Katura is how do Celtic go for this? How do they approach it? Is it a loan or are they going to try and permanently sign him? It's a £6 million optional fee that Schalke have the option of, which doesn't mean he's valued at £6 million. It doesn't mean that Celtic would have to pay £6 million. That's only Schalke at the moment. But what will Celtic do? Will Celtic have to match that figure? Is that the figure that Manchester City are going to, to keep there and try and get from other clubs? Or will Celtic simply go out and try and get him on a loan deal as well for a year? Very interesting because I don't see Celtic paying the likes of £6 million pounds if they're going to pay £6 million plus for Cameron Carter-Vickers. For someone who's probably going to come into Celtic and start off being a backup centre-half, I don't see a spending money like that. So for me, it seems like the kind of player that Celtic might only go for if there's a suitable deal on the table that could be a loan deal. Now that's just in my opinion. I just don't think that the transfer budget that's been laid down for Postecoglou this season will include two £6 million centre-halves. I just don't think it's realistic. So we'll have to wait and see. But he's a very good age with good experience. As I said, the Zweite Bundesliga last season was in a really strong position where you had clubs like Schalke, uh, Werder Bremen, um, Hamburg, Hamburg St. Pauli. You have all these teams towards the top of the table. It's a really strong division. And even down the table, you go down, you've got Dusseldorf, you've got Heidenheim, you've got teams, you know, a lot of good strong sides in there. So he's got experience. He's 25 years of age. Scored four times in his 32 appearances last season. He would be a strong option for Celtic. And it doesn't stop there, as I said, two options that have been considered from Manchester City. The other, the young Englishman, Taylor Harwood Bellis, someone who spent last season on loan to two clubs. The first half of the season, he spent on loan to Anderlecht in uh, Belgium, and then the second half of the season with Stoke City in the English Championship. But another player, and I'll use the same words that have been said in the Sky Sports article, another player that Celtic are monitoring the situation. So once again, no official approach, no uh, inquiries yet as 
for me knowing anyway, but uh, apparently a situation that is being monitored by us. For such a young age, he's got a very impressive CV at the moment, 69 senior appearances um, for clubs like Blackburn, Anderlecht and Stoke City. He's still not made the grade at Manchester City yet, but you know, once again, very tough to get into that position when your competition is the likes of Laporte and John Stones and guys like that. Um, it's not exactly the easiest team to break into when they spend hundreds of millions a season. But last season, in the second half of the season anyway, 22 appearances in the English Championship where he was very impressive for Stoke City and Celtic now looking at bringing him in. And that's the thing, young English centre-half, Playing for a club like Manchester City, once again, I want to touch on the fact that how realistic is Celtic signing a player like this? How much money would Manchester City want? Is it more realistic that Celtic move in for a loan deal, especially with the fact that it could be a backup centre-half? Now, I will say this, he's definitely got starting quality. I think both of the players do, both Koei Katura and uh, Harwood Bellis, especially Harwood Bellis. I think that they both have the quality to come in and start for Celtic, but right now, do you disrupt, disrupt that partnership of Starfield and Cameron Vickers, Cameron Carter Vickers? Do, do any of the two of them, you know, start the season being replaced? I don't think so. So realistically, they are coming in to be a backup at first uh, until they get the opportunity to maybe prove they are starting quality. So I don't see big money being spent, but they are names that we are, as I've said, um, been linked with. And one thing for me is that for Harwood Bellis, big guy, six foot two. And one thing he would answer is a problem that has become apparent in the Celtic support, especially through my comment sections and such. A lot of people have the problem with height in our team. A lot of people don't think we're a very tall team, and I would agree with that. We aren't a very tall team, and especially at the back, both our centre halves, I think, are around six foot, six foot two, um, which would kind of match up almost to the likes of Christopher Julien with his exit looming. Does bring an extra bit of height into that back line, so could be a, a good option. But once again, with more information, with more close links, I will keep you updated on the player, and we'll find out more about him. But another interesting name to be linked with. Wow, a lot of names and a lot of information to keep up with today. I've had to speak at a record speed. So if you haven't managed to keep up, I do apologise, but hopefully you have and hopefully it's kept you informed as to where we are right now with our transfer targets. Um, yes, Cameron v Vickers and Jota, hopefully those deals are edging closer to being completed. We're hearing that they are. So that's another update on that for now. But I've basically said everything I had to say in the two first videos this week in relation to them. Um... Neil Lennon won a trophy. Well done, Neil. Uh, his first trophy uh, as uh, Nascosia manager, Ammonia Nascosia in Cyprus. Um, back winning trophies. Suppose that's good for him. And yeah, I think that's about it. I've, I've spoke so much. I feel like I'm brain dead. I feel like I've just let out so much air without consuming anything. So I'm going to wrap it up there. Let me know what you think in the comments below. Make sure you like and subscribe and I'll see you all next time.